Thank you everyone for joining us this morning. Um, and welcome especially to those who've, of you who may not have come along on any of our walks, the online walks, and also welcome to our regular participants. Um, so before we start, as a, an employee of the City of Port Phillip, I'd like to acknowledge on behalf of the city, um, the Yalakut Willem clan of the Boonwurrung and nation and the traditional owners of the other lands on which we're all located today. So we pay our respects to the elders, both past and present, and acknowledge and uphold their continuing relationship to this land. So today's presentation, as Sandy has outlined, um, we'll be looking at Albert Park, uh, the development of it from its earliest days, and this is the map just to show you the area that we'll be covering this morning. So um, along Ferris Street, we have the former Butt Station, which later became the Albert Park Railway Station. So that's where we're going to be starting and then finding our way along Bridport Street. And we'll be crossing over to Dundas Place, which is on the southern side of Bridport Street, heading along to Albert Park Primary, Mowbray Street, just briefly crossing Victoria Avenue, coming along O'Grady Street, back down Montague Street, where we'll convene again at Bridport Street. So just, just as a starting point, um, you can see on this little map, of the area. Um, a number of street names here that all have naval references. So Bridport Street itself was named after Samuel Hood, the second Baron Bridport, and that Baron was the father of Jane Sarah Hood, who became Lady Hotham after her marriage to prominent Sir Charles Hotham. Um, but other references here, uh, we can see um, Nelson Road, which was named after the great Naval Admiral Horatio Nelson and also um, Merton Street, which was the name of his estate in London. St Vincent Place we have named after John Jervis, who was the first Earl of St Vincent. Uh, Dundas Place after Richard Saunders Dundas, another British naval officer, and Montague Street, who was named after, which was named after John Montague, a Lord of the Admiralty in the 18th century. So beginning our presentation from the Butt Station. So just to provide a little bit of historical perspective. So after the Crimean War in the 1850s, there were some fears about a potential attack on the colony of Victoria and um, some precautions to take to fight against any invasions that may come through the bay. So as a result of these concerns, uh, in the late 1850s, there are a number of rifle butts established along the shoreline, especially at Elwood and St Kilda. So there were batteries there on Head Street, Point Ormond and the foreshore of St Kilda opposite, adjacent to, sorry, um, what became Luna Park. And so beyond this, uh, we have the butts that were established here in Albert Park and further around in Port Melbourne in Sandridge at the time. So these extended all the way around um, to Williamstown. So the, the, five, the five rifle ranges we had in what's now City Port Phillip and then all around to Williamstown. So this provided a defence stretching all the way around Hobson's Bay and the ones, the batteries extending from Elwood to Port Melbourne were all connected by a military road um, along the foreshore, which later became Beaconsfield Parade. So these butts, and we, we can see from the painted image here dating back to 1861. This is when the butts at Albert Park, South Melbourne were established. 
these became known as a central battery, and you can see they were established on what was effectively an open wasteland spreading, extending down to the beach. Um, so these, just to provide a map of the time, circa 1870. Um, so this was a map of the area. We can see that much of um, the area west of the train line, and that this is a train line if you follow the pointer, the train line heading towards St Kilda. So much of this area is undeveloped, and th this is Bridport Street here, and this is where the Butts Station came to be established. And so the, the Butts themselves extended along Richardson Street, and this is roughly where they would have come to the foreshore on at the bottom of Mill Street. And by all by the accounts, these were roughly a 10 minute walk from the butt station. But prior to the butt station being established, uh, there was a push request made to the Melbourne and Hobson's Bay Railway Company that actually owned the line to St Kilda for a, to have a station built in the area of South Melbourne, but that was not considered an option or warranted given the um, small number of passengers that would have been taking the line. But after the butts were established um, down along the beach, then it was considered that they would actually be a train station and hence the name the butt station. And we, we could see from um, this earlier painting, it actually was elevated. The station was elevated and provided a lovely view of the area and also the butt, the short way again from the station there. So the butts themselves, um, interestingly, they were established near where the Middle Park primary school is now on Richardson Street. And some accounts of the time show that um, there was, because of the close proximity to the beach, there were uh, concerns from swimmers in the area of stray bullets flying around. But generally, the uh, there would be flags just to warn people in the area that the rifle shootings were in session. So that they could be protected. But even then, there were complaints also of cattle being killed. Obviously, um, the area was wide open, so we, we did have all sorts of cattle there. And so I'm not sure if some of the shooters were having target practice or otherwise if they were, again, just the stray bullets that may have come off the rifle range. So during the late 1870s, the butts were closed as the area developed. So the housing, building construction, all the way from the railway line down to the beach. So when that commenced in earnest, the butts were closed. And so, so were the ones along the foreshore at St Kilda, Elwood and Port Melbourne. And so the Rifle ranges were relocated to Williamstown in the late 1870s. And so the train station itself, um, the line to St Kilda was established by the Melbourne and Hobson's Bay Railway Company in 1857. So this was the second of Victoria's railway lines, the first being the Sandridge train line, which became the Port Melbourne train line, which was established in 1854. So the line to St Kilda was originally just a one stop route, a direct route from Flinders Street to St Kilda. But um, as mentioned in the 1861, so the Butt station was established as well as stations at the Emerald Hill Market and Middle Park. So the original train station at the, the original Butts train station um, was 
a fairly humble wooden wooden building, much like the one that currently exists still at Middle Park. And so the train station that we can see here, this was the um, Albert Park train station, which was renamed from the Butts in 1872 after the reserve was, Albert Park Reserve was named after Queen Victoria's consort. So in the early 1870s, the train station renamed to Albert Park and this building, 1888. So it's very representative of the railway buildings that were constructed at the time, especially with these Italianate style. Um, and the train, the St Kilda railway line itself was closed in mid 18, sorry, mid 1987 and it was converted to the light rail service, which still operates um, the number, the route 96. And since that time, the station buildings have been used as a garden centre and nursery that's on the western, um, the western side of the station, a cafe and Victoria, Victorian Railways Antique Museum whereas on the opposite side, the eastern side, more recently that has been utilised as a Rudolf Steiner childcare and kindergarten facility. So heading on to Red Street itself, so we're crossing the, the train lines here, the railway lines, and Bridport Street itself does run on either side of the railway lines, so east, it runs all the way up to Eastern Road in South Melbourne. But again, as the walk today is concentrating on um, the western side of Bridport Street, which is very much the commercial heart of Albert Park Village. So we can see here, this is a photograph from the very, very early 20th century. So it's already come a long way, developed, the area has developed a lot, um, especially in the late 1870s, early uh, and into the 1880s and 1890s, especially when uh, Victoria experienced that boom period in building and construction. Um, these also do have a lot of these shops. These are, as you can see, uh, two-storey terrace shops, so they often, many of these had the commercial, the business premises on the ground level, the street level, and residences uh, for families upstairs. So this is a feature of the Bridport Street streetscape, if you like. Um, this is a common element of the architecture, all the, dating all the way back to the Victorian period and then, we'll, as we'll see as we walk through our walk along Bridport Street, that uh, we do have more recent additions to the area, some Edwardian, some Edwardian buildings, as well as post, uh, sorry, interwar and also post-war buildings. We'll have a look at them as we proceed. And firstly, we'll start off with St. Silas Church, which is on the corner of Ferris Street and Bridport Street here. So, um, St. Silas Anglican Church was first established in 1879. First services were conducted in Bevan Street, which is just a small block uh, north of Bridport Street between Bridport and St. Vincent Place. So the earliest of those were, cons sorry, the earliest services of the church operated there from Bevan Street. And shortly after the church was moved to this site, the corner again, Ferris Street and Bridport. Um, so this wooden church stayed on the site until around 1925 when the newer building was first constructed by the architect Lewis Williams. And over time, this, 
this church has had a number of extensions, alterations, but we can see it's a very solid and prominent corner building and still servicing the faithful, the Anglican faithful in the area. And so, yeah, this has been extended in the mid 20th century and also more recently, a number of works have been undertaken. And moving further along, just the next block, this is a the tram which was introduced into the tramways were introduced to Albert Park in 1890s. Um, so this tram we can see is just coming around the corner of Montague Street onto Bridport Street, where it extends all the way down to Victoria Avenue and all the way down to South Melbourne Beach, where there used to be um, the tram sheds and the terminus down there. I might just take a moment um, to speak about this memorial here. We can see two gentlemen to the right leaning against um, what is the Charles Moore Memorial drinking fountain. So Charlie Moore was a Boer War soldier and an Essendon football player. So he went and unfortunately was killed in duty uh, in South Africa in 1901 when he was aged 26. And um, I'm not sure if, if you can see, but in my background, um, the, the fountain itself features in that Bridport Street scape as well. So Charlie Moore, uh, sorry, Charles Moore, the memorial um, was relocated from this corner in Bridport Street and Montague, Montague Streets up to St. Vincent, the St. Vincent Gardens in 1922. So just also at the corner here of again Bridport and Montague Street, um, we have a row of a row of shops again. These ones a lot smaller, just a single level, uh, single level shops, row of shops here. Um, so these were constructed in 1901 and they're a lot more conservative, a lot less decorative than a lot of the, the terraces that we've seen um, along Bridport Street. Um, so this we can see aside of the gents hairdressers, we can see Andrew's hamburgers. So these uh, Andrew's hamburgers has the notable title of being Melbourne's original hamburger. So the shop Andrew's hamburgers was established in 1939 by a post-war migrant from Cyprus. So uh, we will see some references to in the area to um, the services that were provided to the Greek community. Um, but this Andrew's Hamburgers has turned into something of an institution in Albert Park and has won or been voted many times the best hamburgers in Melbourne and what to speak of Australia. So the, the little hamburger restaurant is still actually being operated by the same family. And proceeding along Bridport Street, we have what is perhaps the most iconic building um, in Albert Park, the Albert Park Village, is uh, the Biltmore. So this building, you can see quite imposing building um, at number 152 to 158 on Bridport Street, was constructed in 1888 by the, and it was established by the temperance movement. So it was originally established as a temperance hotel and it was originally called the Albert Park Coffee Palace. And you can see in the photograph right at the top, um, there is the name, the Coffee Palace, and it looks like 
it's also written out here just above the ground level entrance. So this was one of a number of coffee palaces established throughout Melbourne in especially in the late 19th and early 20th century as an alternative to the demon drink, so alcohol and all of the ills, social ills that it brought with it. So the temperance movement and these coffee palaces offered an alternative to this. So for travellers, um, they provided accommodation and also entertainment that was obviously partaken without any alcohol or anything else. So other examples of the prominent temperance hotels, coffee palaces if you like, uh, were the original Windsor Hotel in the city of Melbourne. And also we do have another, there was another coffee palace on Grey Street in St Kilda. And those of you who have come along on some of our other walks, there was also famously the Temperance Hall in South Melbourne on Napier Street. So the original architect of the Coffee Palace was Walter Scott Law, who's also renowned for a lot of his work, which was primarily done in the inner city suburb of Carlton. So when it was originally built, it had 50 bedrooms and over time, alterations and additions were carried out. And um, the first of those were undertaken by the local architect Frederick de Garris. And then um, in the late 1920s, there were some additional bedrooms added uh, in a redesign of the building. And it was then that the Albert Park Coffee Palace was actually sold and it was bought, uh, purchased in 1930 and renamed as the Biltmore. And it's thought to have been um, named after the famous hotel in Los Angeles. And at that stage, it was turned into a private guest house. And during the 19, sorry, during the Second World War, um, it was used to house a number of American soldiers while they were, while they had their quarters built in um, Albert Park Reserve, at the southern end, St Kilda end of Albert Park Reserve. And then after the war, it was again run as a boarding place, uh, sorry, a boarding house uh, before being purchased in 1950 by the Royal Melbourne Hospital. And so this, it did function for a number of years um, in the 1950s and 60s as a night nurse's quarters uh, from where the nurses were transported from here, from the Biltmore into the hospital. And this right up at the top, this the tallest part of the building. So this apparently was used as a sitting room for the nurses. Um, and again, in the mid 1960s, late 1960s, the building was sold again and reverted to its use as a as a boarding house. Whereas later on in the 1970s and 80s, it was run as restaurant. Uh, sorry. Um, the downstairs were run as restaurant and bars, and in 1993, it was again converted into private residences. And we can see also just how this building, the Biltmore, actually dwarfs the other buildings in the area. And again, it it is very much one of Albert Park's most iconic. Just a few doors down from the Biltmore, uh, we have what was the Kinema Theatre, which was built in 1920. So this photograph shows the Kinema in its early incarnation as a Hoyt cinema, um, which had seating for up to 1500 people. Um, the kinema was repurposed, redesigned in the late 1930s. And you can see from this photograph here, a definite Art Deco facade, and which is still evident in the current building, 
uh, the current design of the building, which is we can see a very commercial, a commercial and office space. Um, but the kinema, the theatre here, so it was screening films produced by MGM, Paramount and Universal Studios, whereas some of the other cinemas that we'll come across in the presentation, they were showing the films of different production companies such as Fox and RKO films. So in the mid 1960s, um, the kinema was sold, it get changed hands and was operated by the cosmopolitan change of cinemas. And at that stage, it was screening both Greek and English language films. And so if I just zoom in here, um, we can see that this photograph dating back to the 1970s, we can see that it is at this stage showing Greek Greek films. And so again, the kinema, so it was showing these, the Greek and English language films um, during the 1970s, as we've seen, it was showing just solely Greek language, uh, Greek language features, um, but it did come to suffer in the late, sorry, in the early 1980s with the advent of SBS, which was screening and broadcasting a lot of Greek material. So it did come to more or less its end. For the, for the last few years, it did operate as an art house theatre before it screened its last films in 1983. And um, just before we head on to the next building along our walk, I'll just um, point out the red brick, that this red brick terrace office that you can see just beside um, the former kinema. Very narrow and very tall, the building. Um, these were the offices of Mackin and Shepherd. We can still see um, their original advertising still painted there, visible on the western side of the building. So originally, this built, uh, sorry, this um, terrace offices were built in 1901. At that stage, it was the business, the estate business of F. G. Hartley and William Mackin. So they also had offices in Bank Street in South Melbourne, as well as Canterbury Road in Middle Park. So Mackin and Shepherd as a company was formed in 1926 and the business, as we can see from the old sign that's still visible on the wall there, was an agent for the London and Lancashire Insurance Company. And heading on to the corner of Bridport Street and Merton Street in Albert Park rather than um, Victoria, <laughs> Victoria Avenue and Merton Street in Middle Park. Um, this was the original post office in the area. So we can see that was also a real estate agent and money order bank, bank servicing. So this particular place now is a cafe that's being renovated as we speak. And so crossing over um, to Dunder's Place, so on the southern side of Bridport Street, we have um, the former Albert Park Post Office, the newer, the newer Albert Park Post Office, which was established in 1924 and notably is the only government building in the Bridport Street strip. And we can see that it's constructed with many classical elements, the columns and the classical classical style that actually fits in quite well with the surrounding streetscape and the uh, Victorian terraces that feature so prominently. Um, so this, the post office was closed in the early 2000s and in nine, sorry, in 2012, 
um, a set of apartments was built on top of the post of the original post office, which was itself converted into a boutique supermarket and grocers. So moving along Dundas Place, we can see here some more of the terraced Victorian shops, um, a whole range of businesses, grocers, undertakers and butchers here just as examples of the commercial hub here and on the corner of Dundas Place and Merton Street so just opposite the original uh, post office we have cash grocer and it's just curious that uh, this particular building on the corner has for more than 100 years been or more than 120 years um, served as a supermarket grocer so even nowadays it's a little IGA supermarket and just opposite the supermarkets here we have um, this is number one Victoria Avenue which was a prominent another prominent Albert Park landmark so this was built during the nine, sorry, the 1880s and was remodeled in the 1920s and 30s, where it was a medical clinic and at the frontage, and we can see a number of residences at the rear there. So this was also, this site was also famously uh, the home of famous Australian filmmaker Paul Cox, uh, film director Paul Cox, who passed away in 2016. So after after his death, the property was sold and a developer had plans to demolish these uh, these buildings and um, construct a four a four leveled service departments, which thankfully um, was actually denied both demolition, the demolition as well as the building permits were denied by both the city of Port Phillip, the Port Phillip Council and, and VCAT. Um, it was also the subject of a great community outpouring of support. So as it stands, um, the demolition and the building won't be going ahead at the moment, but the developer has come back with a, a counter design. So we'll have to see what happens here, but it's just a good example, I think, of just rallying the community together in order to save some of the iconic historic buildings in Albert Park. On our walk is the former Wesleyan Church um, on the corner of Bridport Street, Cardigan Place and Mowbray Street. Um, so this was built, actually it was built on land that was granted by the government in 1870, but um, the church itself wasn't built until 1890. And the majority of the construction costs were donated by the prominent local businessman, councillor and mayor John Danks, who was a member of the congregation and also dedicated the cornerstone to the church. So the church itself has been non-operational since the mid 20th century. Um, and even up until that time, it was used as an annex to the primary school, which we'll have a look at it in a moment. And it was in 18, sorry, 1970 um, that the church was actually purchased by the education department and renovated as an annex for the Albert Park Primary School. And we'll have a moving on to the primary school. So this is an old photograph of the school fronting onto Bridport Street. Um, so the primary school 1181 Albert Park was founded in January 1873 uh, and the architect Joseph Schneider won the competition to design the school buildings 
Uh, and while these while the school was being constructed, um, the students had their teaching conducted in the Mechanics Institute on the corner of Dorcas Street and Cecil Street in South Melbourne. But, but the, the school itself opened in 1874 and when they moved the students and staff moved into the new building. And 10 or so years later, the enrolments reached more than 1500. So there was a push also to establish another school which came to be the Middle Park Primary School um, in 1887. So in 1901, there was a proposal for a separate infant school, which they was colloquially called the small school, uh, which was established up on Richardson Street, just off Richardson Street rather, on Henderson Street, and that was finally completed in 1914. So the school obviously has undergone a number of alterations since the early 20th century. Um, and in 1970, um, the, the frontage along Bridport Street it was being blocked every every morning um, by council workers with kerosene drums, which were taken down at the end of the school day to open up Bridport Street again to traffic. Um, but around about that time, Bridport Street was actually closed and incorporated into the school grounds. So Bridport Street actually did divide the school that we can see here and the the church that we just spoke about. Um, but after yeah, in the early 1970s, the whole whole area was opened up as school grounds. So more recently, um, we've seen the new a new library and arts centre established on on the school site. And sorry, just to show um, this is a photograph from last week with the Albert Park Primary School kids. Very happy to be back at school, I'm sure after such a long time away this year. Um, but this is just to show some of the developments that have happened more recently. Um, we can see behind the church, we've got a few residential places. I think there's three um, terraces. They're built on the same block. And over on the opposite side, um, we can see this little park um, or this little reserve on Mowbray Street, which is also being closed off to through traffic um, that provides just a little public reserve used by both the school and um, yeah, the local Albert Park residents. Um, and behind this, we can see more classrooms, so much more contemporary classrooms um, added onto the site. And so, yeah, this, this little building uh, sorry, this little reserve was opened in 2013. So moving along up Mowbray Street onto Victoria Avenue, we have Tobruk House, which houses the Victorian branch of the Rats of Tobruk Association, which itself was established in 1945 in honour of the 14,000 Australian soldiers who fought with the Allied forces in the siege of Tobruk, the Libyan port from April to December 1941. So the name the rats was originally a derogatory term given by a Nazi propagandist, but the Australian, particularly the Australian soldiers came to adopt the name with a sense of pride, a name that described the conditions that they lived in throughout World War II, scuttling like rats through the trenches and living in the caves there. So arguably, the rats of Tobruk are Australia's most celebrated army garrison. Um, unfortunately, though, more than 1,200 Australian soldiers either died or went missing in action uh, during that Second World War. So the building itself here was constructed in 1926 and was purchased in 1956 by the Rats of Tobruk Association and it was opened in September of that year, 1956. 
So the house has served the rats community for more than 60 years. And as almost all of the original rats of Tobruk have passed away, the association has extended its membership to their descendants. So we have a total of around about 400 of those people uh, throughout Australia. And as we cross Victoria Avenue, came across this historical image, which just provides a little bit of a glimpse into this, what's effectively an extension of Bridport Street. Um, so Victoria Avenue, we can see on the southern side, we've got just like Bridport Street, a lot of commercial buildings, um, grocers, hotels, and other services. Whereas the northern, the northern aspect of Victoria Avenue is very much residential. And we also directly opposite the Rats, uh, sorry, to Brook House, we do have uh, there is a reserve that has been named in 2008, was named in 2008 as Rats of Tobruk Reserve. Just a simple garden, a few trees, small garden, a bench, as well as a plaque commemorating the Rats of Tobruk. So we'll head up here to O'Grady Street. And this is the home of ultimately what ultimately became the Ducks Theatre. So originally um, this was the site housed the Presbyterian Church, Albert Park's Presbyterian Church. It was constructed in 1885 and served the community for 25 odd years before it was sold in 1910 when the Albert, Albert the Presbyterian Congregation of Albert Park and Middle Park amalgamated into a new building that was constructed on Richardson Street, just opposite the Middle Park Primary School. So in 1912, um, the church site, the original building was converted into the Ducks Theatre. So we can see here a very large, very large entertainment building or public hall, so as well as um, as well as early moving pictures, uh, the the building also hosted a number of plays, pantomimes, and musicals, as well as being a popular venue for presentations. And notably, um, Alfred Deakin spoke here on behalf of a Liberal candidate just shortly after the Ducks Theatre was opened. And so we can see the name spread across the front facade. And also we had um, electric sign on top here. So unfortunately, the Ducks Theatre was a, was a victim or rather a casualty of the developing um, talking pictures, so the sound pictures. So ultimately it closed around about 1930. So, and since that time, it's been occupied as a storage warehouse and more recently as studios and office space. In 2014 though, it was used as a site for the block. So one of a number of uh, buildings throughout South Melbourne that have featured on the block. So this is a current picture, current photograph of the original Ducks building. You can still see it's maintained much of its original facade and we also have the rooftop, the rooftop here that has been converted into the uh, four apartments featured on the block. And I'm um, going along Mont, uh, sorry, down O'Grady Street into Montague Street. Another prominent building is the Albert Park Hotel, which was opened in 1883 by Thomas and Margaret Walsh, who had previously operated the Wexford Arms, which is about a kilometer down the road on Park Street. Um, so this 
original 19th century building uh, was renovated during the 1930s into its current modernist style. And it's again, a very imposing building. Um, and just to show you some of the additions, the renovations that have been made. So this photograph from the late 1980s shows those um, the modernist style, the Art Deco lines and portholes. This photograph looks as though it's been taken from the Biltmore across the road. And this is the currently, this is the newest version of the Albert Park Hotel, which has been actually had quite extensive renovations over the last few years. And it looks like it's just sitting there ready to be reopened. Um, and just opposite the, the hotel, um, on the corner of Dundas Place and Montague Street, in the 1930s, 1938, um, the, park, the Park Theatre was built here. Um, and was the last, we've, this is the last of the trio of cinemas that we've had a look at after the Kinema and the Ducks. So this was open around the same time that the Ducks was being refurbished into its deco form. And also we can see the external streamline design of the Hoyt Cinema, which extended inside to the fancy box office and staircase here. So the, this, the Park Theatre also had a capacity of 1500 and it was one of the first cinemas in Melbourne to have an electric organ. Uh, unfortunately, into the 1950s, um, cuts were made to the number of screenings. We have a dwindling number of audience attendees. Um, so by that stage in the 1950s, the screenings dropped off to Thursday, Friday and Saturday nights, as well as Saturday matinees. Um, and later on into the 1960s, the patronage had dropped off nearly altogether. And so there were only two screen, two weekly screenings on a Saturday evening. Um, and in 1961, the site was sold to the Amoco oil company. And we can see from this 1970s photograph, um, a petrol station was established on the site. And <clears throat> so that ran into the 1970s and in the 19 early, early to mid 1980s, um, the site was redeveloped as the Albert Park Library, which is itself undergoing <laughs> renovations right now. Um, so just to complete our little tour of Bridport Street and the environs. Um, there was a curious little incident that I came upon um, that was featured in the newspapers of the time. So this was in November 1886. Uh, this appeared in The Age. So a little visual recreation of events that took place on Dundas Place or the National Bank on the corner of Dundas Place and Montague Streets here. So a daring daylight robbery by two young men who were, according to the newspaper reports, recent arrivals in the colony and both of uninviting appearance. So we can see here that they've attempted to rob the branch and um, the sub manager whose name was Mr. Dare, has actually stood up to the would-be robbers um, who did actually flee with as much as a hundred pounds, um, but he chased after them. And we can see here, he was joined by a small crowd of locals who managed to capture, to capture the robbers at the railway station there. So I just thought that was a interesting little story just to bring us all the way back to Bridport Street 
and the railway station here. So um, that's the end of the presentation. Thank you.